Good morning. It is Friday. Back when we were doing transmission, which is the vidcast, vid stream that I did with Dan, um, it was always fascism Friday. But then we realized that we were just talking about fascism all the time, directly or indirectly, because, you know, shitty world that we live in right now. Um, and this actually ties in uh, with Simone Weil, because Simone Weil um, is an interesting figure who uh, engaged a lot of things, including fighting fascists. Um, so I'm just going to try to like give an overview of Simone Weil and her first kind of like her life and then some of her thoughts um, without going too deep, because I could just go super deep. Um, and talking about Simone Weil. And uh, she's a very, very dense thinker. And so it's not as though like I comprehend everything that she wrote about. But for those who are interested in knowing more about Simone Weil, there is a, her classic biography from her friend whose name escapes me at the moment. But this is a great little introductory thing. It probably looks backwards to you. Um, but it's The Subversive Simone Weil, A Life and Five Ideas by Robert Zaretsky. Um, and so this gives a little bit of an overview of her life story and then talks about five key ideas. But here, let me just give you a, a back, a little bit of the backstory. Uh, Simone Weil um, was French, a French Jew. And uh, the interesting thing is that she, growing up, her parents were kind of bourgeois, um, but leftists. And so a frequent house guest, whenever he was traveling through France, was Trotsky. So she hung out with Trotsky and they corresponded via letters when she was a very young woman. Um, and Trotsky would often get stressed out by her because she's one of those really irritating, overly smart people. And Simone Weil, um, in her teens, uh, was basically super advanced in calculus and mathematics and instructed was an instructor in it, uh, studied the classics, was very influenced by Greek philosophy and some of the great epic um, stories of, of Greece. And um, just an all around polymath, but she's most known as a philosopher and a mystic. Um, Albert Camus referred to her as the only great spirit of the age. Um, she had an interesting life where she, there was this combination of her philosophical convictions that, um, and I'm going to get to this a little bit, um, filtered through her mystical experiences, um, but then also was this leftist who wanted to make good on her convictions. And, you know, you could, ease, you could categorize her as an anarchist. She definitely leaned that way. Um, definitely not a Marxist. She had a lot of critiques towards Marxism. But here, here's the thing. Um, as a young woman, you know, she realized she wanted to kind of do this stuff. And she, she thought, I need to go work in a factory with the workers so that I can kind of be in solidarity with them. But she was super sickly and inept. And so she didn't really, wasn't able to keep her job for any long. Later on, during the Spanish Civil War, she wanted to go fight the fascists. Um, but she poured hot boiling oil on herself and had to get sent to a hospital to convalesce. Um, one, you know, another little interesting thing about her is um, her first mystical experience, she'd get these horrible migraines. And she would meditate over George Herbert's poem on love. And uh, it was then she had a mystical experience of Jesus. She always refused to actually be baptized and become a full Christian in her mind because of her love for those outside the church. She ended up dying at a young age, I think she was 34, if I'm remembering correctly, because she was sick and she refused to eat more than the rations that soldiers in the Spanish Civil War had. And so she died young. Now, why the hell would I be fascinated by someone like that, someone so complicated contradictory, messy, and with her ideas being kind of impenetrable and focusing on ideas of like how affliction is a path towards God, which is a very murky idea. 
it, because she was messy. And she's one of the few f- figures out there who really tried to bring her spirituality um, into direct connection with her radicalism in a very original way. She was still developing her thoughts about what resistance looks like. And never that's one of her least fleshed out ideas when she died. And so in a lot of ways, I feel like I'm trying to take in my own work uh, a lot of the ideas that she had, filter them through liberation theology, and then try to ask the sorts of questions about resistance that she never got to engage. Um, well, with that, I'm just going to pull Kaylee in here. I'm going to start having a conversation about Simone Weil and Simone Weil's implications. Um, hey. Hey. Um, I know this one's going to be dense maybe for people, um, so don't feel daunted by me having, like us having a conversation about this philosopher. If anything is sparking in your mind about this or deconstruction, because really this, I'm bringing Simone Weil in to talk about deconstruction in a kind of way. So feel free to ask questions, anything that pops up, or if it's from earlier this week, if you're if you're watching everybody. Um, uh, I'll also point out my my favorite of Simone Weil's books, um, Oppression and Liberty. Got a little footnote out there. Um, there's some key ideas, and one of the things, the reasons I pointed out this book for people who are maybe interested is. It covers five of the main ideas of Simone Weil. Um, and these are really important things. Like one of them is the idea of roots. She has this great one-liner, the uprooted uproot wherever they go. So the sort of uh, rootlessness is this experience of being um, kind of contextless, which for those of us who have kind of studied anti-oppression stuff, um, the category of being white is a fundamentally rootless category. So this idea of, of loss of place and connection in history causes all sorts of oppression in the world. That's one of her ideas. The other idea is that attention is the rarest and purest form of generosity. It's the way we begin to become rooted again is by giving our attention to people. Um, and m- more ideas than that. But like, um, I, she was also referred, she was friends in school with Simone Beauvoir who called her the Red Virgin because she somehow had a lot of body hatred and, you know, never engaged in sex. She died a virgin, as far as we know. All these fucking contradictions, which I find fascinating. Um, have you ever read anything of Simone Weil or know anything about Simone Weil before I, I started yammering about her? I'm, I mean, I know, I've known a little bit, um, just picking up here and there, because we reuse a lot of Simone Weil um, here at CPI. And so that's that's really what yeah, I, could where kind I kind of figure out like I need to know a little bit about this person because yeah, no, this is always talking about someone Bay. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's kind of been my experience ex, experience with Simone Bay. But mm-hmm. I mean that kind of that makes sense with like how I grew up because radical like leftist almost anarchist thought uh, thought leaders aren't necessarily the type of people that were upheld in the type of community that I grew up in. <laughs> so um, huh. there, like, I am learning that there's a lot more people that maybe I should know a little bit about that. I just, I don't know about <laughs> that. I, I need to like do some, a lot more reading and catch up to some other people. <laughs> I mean, a lot of this stuff, you know, it kind of seems obscure because you know, we in the United States, we don't really think in terms of uh, anarchist or leftist uh, philosophical history as part of our, it's not mm-hmm. part of the, we don't think of it as part of the US DNA. But yeah, I mean, it really was like at the turn of the, you know, 19th century into the 19th century, um, there was all kinds of radicalism. You know, McKinley mm-hmm. was assassinated by an anarchist who, um, who wanted to impress Emma Goldman, who was a famous mm-hmm. anarchist. And so he murdered McKinley. Um, there was the Sacco and Vanzetti trials, uh, you know, all sorts of things that were happening when radicalism was part of, you know, leftist radicalism was part of the US mainstream, but it hasn't mm-hmm. been for well over a hundred years. So we don't think about that. Um, but yep. there's all these very important figures, largely in, in Europe that shaped things. And mm-hmm. we've kind of lost a lot of that 
context to the point where, um, you know, especially with the Christian stuff, like, yeah, we there was definitely a deliberate attempt leading up to World War II and after to link Christianity with capitalists' um, ways of thinking, which hasn't always been the mm -hmm. case. People think that that's how it always was, and it wasn't. If you're a yeah, yeah, minister really before World War II, you were just as likely to be a socialist as anything else. Because mm -hmm. it's made sense. But it's all been stolen from us. Oh, it's, uh, Ash Matt it, it, says, Emma Goldman, and gives us a blue heart. Yeah. Emma Goldman is... Uh, we could talk about Emma Goldman too. Any of these <laughs> figures I could nerd out about for like yeah. ever. But um, the like the redefining of the, I mean there there's like such a shift, especially um after uh, after World War Two, um within like the narrative of Christianity and the narrative of uh, even like the United States and um like the, the it's so weird because like if you really want to go into that idea of make america great again right which mm -hmm. sorry for the for no trigger warning there um that's like not actually american history like american history is really messy there there's there were things like the great awakening because there was times before that that uh weren't um weren't super christian and we could debate whether or not the great awakening was actually a good thing or not but um that's a it's a so, whole different whole different discussion <laughs> uh but there, like there's it, it's weird because i feel like there was kind of a um siphoning of u.s history and what we think is as american thought that mm -hmm. has kind of been filtered down into like this very conservative um narrative that just really doesn't exist <laughs> the, like that's not the actual history of the united states the united states has had a lot of different figures and thoughts and leaders and um sure maybe world war ii like brought us together against a common enemy which that's also a false narrative <laughs> um but the like the idea that we have to um kind of suppress the variety of views so like we have a coherent story like that's really messed up because that's not that's not people that's um it's like a glorified what you wish your history was and i guess i mean we're seeing that now today mm -hmm. still so you know and um someone like simone ve um i mean she really you know <laughs> And this is, you know, I don't want to sound too intellectual <laughs> in the sense of like um, overemphasizing the importance of kind of a classical uh, humanities education, which I think is important. Um, but she would have seen herself as kind of part of this grand story. Like, you know, the, these folks, a lot of these radical figures, like from Marx, um, mm -hmm. Lenin, they had a huge sweeping understanding of how um, of what history was and the place in it. So the idea of um, for many of us in the United States, we're kind of like shaped into sort of an ah historical kind of way of seeing things, mm -hmm. which empires almost always do. Empires will um, want to see themselves as the end of history. Something like Foucault talks a, a lot about, I think. This idea, maybe that, not, maybe not the end of history, but like, this is what history, it, like all of history, was meant to get us to this. To and this, this. and so we are now in the yeah. last, like now everything after is like this is the goal. Yep. We are the yep. end, the the realized vision. Um, and when and we you get into that sort of thing, then you then the past becomes largely irrelevant, except for the mm -hmm. stuff, the the parts of history that we tell that reinforce the myth. So, you know, uh -huh. you know, that's why kids in school in the United States um, will learn about, you know, the founding fathers and Abraham Lincoln. And so, uh -huh. um, not about uh, a lot of the other stuff that yeah, doesn't reinforce stuff. the myths. Yeah. Like it, when it comes uh, time for Columbus Day, we didn't learn about, we didn't learn about the real Columbus. <laughs> mm -hmm. We learned about 
we learned about this dude that like uh had a fight to have a chance to explore and uh then made it to america and realized that the world wasn't the the world wasn't flat and uh it's just like it, it it's a false narrative of uh erasing like the full like context context of who these these characters are <laughs> um to make it more palpable because Columbus was an awful, terrible human being. Uh, our most of our founding fathers were slave owners. Our first president was a slave owner. Uh, like, th like there's like this fear that if we look at how we actually got here, then we're going to like lose where we're at. Um, and like you said, we if we see ourselves as like the pinnacle of civilization, like all of humanity has been hoping to get to this one spot and we have to like protect it because like it, there's only downhill from here. Um, like that, that becomes that becomes a d dire need to fill your narrative that way. So people don't look at like your foundation, like the foundation mm -hmm. of America is rather racist and we still have racist systems in america mm -hmm. so uh but if, if if we don't like actually acknowledge it then um we can't like uh tear down this uh, ideology of having peaked i guess mm -hmm. um let alone the idea that maybe we could actually do a little bit better if we started tearing down these systems that are oppressive and built on racist ideologies so you know, just to kind of connect this with Simone Weil and deconstruction explicitly. So we have this whole way of thinking about things um, in the United States that kind of um, is easy to fall into, like this sort of framework, a set of myths um, that are hard for some people to challenge, um, that we kind of assume. And uh, when we start thinking about, you know, all the generic rah-rah American stuff, evangelicalism. And, you know, for me growing up in rural Minnesota, this is kind of um, my bread and butter. I just kind of grew up in this sort of thing. Deconstructing mm -hmm. then isn't about like just questioning ideas because this doesn't make logical sense. We start questioning things because we feel um, discontent about it. Something feels off and we want something other or more. So this is where the desire mm -hmm. thing that I was talking about on Wednesday comes in. And so Simone Weil, to me, is a great example of that, of someone who is just not willing to settle. And so um, so as a young, like how old was she? Like when she was uh, looking up some notes here, when she was like basically 12, she just declared herself a Bolshevik, right? Interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. 10. She was 10 years of age. She declared um, herself a Bolshevik. In her late teens, she became involved in the workers' movement, writing political tracts and marching in demonstrations. Um, <laughs> uh, but then in 1932, she, um, while visiting Germany to help Marxists organize, um, she began to realize that they were no match for the growing fascist movement. And so she started interrogating things. So still very, very young. Um, when Hitler rose to power in 1933, Simone Weil helped the German communists flee. Um, but through her like struggle with like trying to figure out how to be in solidarity with solidarity with workers, um, mm -hmm. uh, she kind of started really rethinking things and started shifting more and more towards anarchism. Even though she was a pacifist, uh, she joined the uh, the anarchists in the Spanish Civil War. But this kind of fucked her up because um, <laughs> two things happened. Like she burned herself, but then uh, the general who is in charge of her, like, I don't know what they called him, the regiment or whatever, kept on not wanting, wanting her to go home because she thought she was irritating and kind of not good to have around. But she would always say, I have every right to sacrifice myself if I choose. Um, a month after she left the Spanish Civil War because she was convalescing, uh, her entire unit was wiped out including all the women in the unit and so she she looked at that um and this kind of then began her, her more mystical turn um she had a mystical experience um in a chapel where saint francis had prayed so all this sort of like 
all this movement is like her interrogating like her assumptions and wanting to if she had an inkling of what something was true um she would just tuck herself into it even though she didn't w really fit there's a tenacity mm -hmm. here and to me this is the heart of the construction even though she moved from kind of an atheistic perspective towards more of a mystical one um to me that's still deconstruction because she's deconstructing she's not she's not just accepting the narratives around her even as mm -hmm. people are telling her to go home and shut the fuck up she's like no i'm going to keep interrogating this and allow myself to to change and grow she did a lot in her 34 years of life yeah. um, and to me this is sort of this question like for us and for anyone who's listening now or later um how do we attend to those deep stirrings and convictions and allow ourselves to risk everything exploring what is most meaningful to us to me is the question of what deconstruction is about um, mm -hmm. to, to think about it in terms of like oh i'm an ex-evangelical and but i used to be an evangelical is too narrow of a way of thinking about this shit. yeah it is yeah. i mean it's like as long as you're not i mean it's a label just like any other label like it it's meant to point you into a ballpark it's not meant to be um the box that you jump into uh and maybe even a ballpark isn't it's too small of a uh, too small of an area mm -hmm. like and yeah i don't know but i am finding like i'm finding this curious that we're talking about this on veterans day and is it veterans day i never know vet that veterans day yeah i mean well, she was a vet she was a veteran she was a veteran um uh, but the I'm, Spanish like, I, fucking civil war. Yep. But I'm a I'm a vet I'm a veteran also. Mm -hmm. Um and I left after almost nine years as a conscientious objector. <laughs> so uh my my views on uh, on war and stuff um de have definitely shifted. Uh because yeah, because I was like I grew up very like pro military, pro like uh America, America first and stuff. Uh, and that, like that really changed whenever I actually, uh, actually started to understand like, you know, people are people um, and a lot of us are born in different areas and we have to deal with whatever shit is going on in those areas. Um, and maybe, maybe I shouldn't need to kill people to like have healthcare. Cause like that's, that's really what it came down to. I joined the military for healthcare, for uh, housing and a stable job um, because I was poor. And um, I think well, I think I'm uh, rabbit trailing, but I, I mean, it, I it ties in. I mean, you were in a, in a lot of ways, you were the poster child of what the American conservative. So uh, yeah, even evangelical, uh, evangelical military, military service uh christian ministry degree <laughs> like yeah but uh very much so um and i was and, but yeah. yeah i was i was almost like you know i think i can't remember if i've told this story on this but like you know i didn't join the military i was about to mm -hmm. become you know to go into the, to do chaplaincy um and then 9 11 happened and it freaked me out not because like, I'm afraid of war, but like, what the fuck? This seems gross the way people are acting about this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was in that poster child ballpark too. Young evangelical got married as a virgin. Um, all the things. <laughs> all the things. Know, a, all the things. And it's, um, in a way though, that those, the way I committed to those things was in a deconstructive way. Like, even though I was buying into it, it was like I was going after it. It wasn't that I was just settling into what was expected. It was that I was pursuing. And if there's a tenacity, and then I realized, and I, I'm like, this isn't, this doesn't seem right. So I need to keep looking. That sort of. I was, mean, was that your experience? Yeah. Like when you were living in the heart think, of, of being the poster child of America. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I think that's the experience of a lot of people that, especially like especially queer people that deconstruct and leave the church. Like, so many of us 
ha- like have studied the Bible and have like honestly pursued like conservative Christianity. Um, and so like, it's really funny whenever people call us out and be like, you were never Christian anyways. And it's like, my, I was, I was far more Christian than, than you've ever been. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. Christian, Christian in the sense of what, what was expected of us. Um, but yeah. And then just because of digging into it and because of trying what well, basically because of following it is what ultimately led me out. Um, and yeah, I'm no, I'm no longer the golden child in my family. <laughs> That's okay. Um, yeah, I don't think, yeah, I don't think anyone in my family, um, or I grew up with that still in really Christian would think I'm one of them anymore, which is mm-hmm. funny. It's kind of funny to me. Um, I want to read a, you know, I, I have to read something from Simone Weil if we're going to talk about her because she wrote a lot of shit. Um, This uh, is from Waiting for God, which is probably her best known thing. It's not my favorite, but a lot of people love starting here. Um, She writes, the beauty of the world is the mouth of a labyrinth. The unwary individual who on entering takes a few steps is going, is soon unable to find the opening. Worn out with nothing to eat or drink, in the dark, separated from his dear ones and from everything he loves and is accustomed to, he walks on without knowing anything or hoping anything, incapable even of discovering whether he is really going forward or merely turning round on the same spot. But this affliction is as nothing compared with the danger threatening him. For if he does not lose courage, if he goes on walking, it is absolutely certain that he will finally arrive at the center of the labyrinth. And there God is waiting to eat him. Later he will go out again, but will be changed. He will have become different after being eaten and digested by God. Afterward, he will stay near the entrance so that he can gently push all those who come near him into the opening. So (laughs) she's she's a bit dramatic, but this idea of... Um, persisting through affliction is a huge thing for Simone Bay. The idea that if you keep mm-hmm. wandering, you will eventually find yourself at the heart of the labyrinth where you'll be consumed by God. And then when you go out again, you'll push other people into the labyrinth. Really is a framework of how she lived her life. And to me, even though that what I just read seems like the opposite of deconstruction, for her it was this sort of like stripping away, rejecting everything that is not God, until you find yourself in the center and you're transformed, consumed, eaten and digested, like basically becoming God's shit. <laughs> That's kind of what she's, what she's saying here. And, um, uh, but it's good to think about this in light of, you know, the quote I read. It's in the, the description for today. I read it on Monday that for her, it wasn't her pursuing God necessarily. It was just, persisting in refusing to accept anything that is not God. So anything that does not shimmer and pulse with life, she would be uninterested and she'd keep going deeper and deeper until she had these mystical experiences that changed her. And uh, we don't have to have mystical experiences to kind of take that posture in life. We just have to be tenacious in our um, unwillingness to accept uh, the script that society Mm -hmm. hands to us. And, I'll, and be willing to follow where that leads, which Simone Weil embodied. I kind of, I'm always pissed that she died so young because I would have been curious to see how she would have continued to write and reflect. Um, but yeah, but in your life, my life, so many people that may be listening can relate to this idea of like um, allowing ourselves to be agitated enough to keep pursuing something. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the only way I ended up realizing I was trans is that way, because I didn't grow up thinking I was a princess in a prince's body. I didn't think about it that way. It's through this sort of tenacious exploration of what's really going on here. Yeah. Um, well, I feel like I, w- I feel like I was able to sneak 
Simone Vey into this series. And so I have a mission accomplished. Anytime I can bring up Simone Vey, like it's like it's not as off putting as my obsession for karaoke for people, but there's these things that are like <laughs> that are kind of like I'm known for. In my house, yeah. like our house, this was our last community house of the Mennonite worker. I'm pointing out I'm in a shed, and so the house is that way. Um it's named Simone Vey House. Like so I just got to nerd out a little bit about my lady. The Red Virgin. Nice. Nice. Um, so just to kind of give people a, a heads up about what's coming next week. Um, next week, we're going to start um, kind of like giving updates on our fundraising goals, because next week um, is when we kind of do our big push starting. Um, but we're going to mm -hmm. be talking about the theme of liberation, which will be interesting. I'm going to go a little bit into my a little more of my story about how I broke from the American dream uh, to start off. Then we're going to talk about the theme of liberation. And then we're going to talk about one of my new favorite um, heretical saints, uh, Rosa Egyptiaca, which her story is fucking amazing. So that'll be <laughs> next week will be fun. A lot of fun. Good. Good. Um, yeah. So everybody, um, I'm going to post this just to give everyone a chance to take a look. Um, we're trying to raise twenty thousand um, dollars between now and, and Christmas, basically, um, including having twenty five new sustaining members. Um, if you want to know what that all that means, just go to propheticimagination.org. Give what you can, um, and also um, you can if you go to our website, you can see the stuff we're doing. Um, and I'll hope start sharing a little bit more about that next week too. Um, some of the things we've got going um, for next year, which will be fun. So we'll see you all next week. Awesome. Bye. Bye. <laughs>